So brothers and sisters, what I want to do today is I want to give you an overview of the school to prison pipeline from the eyes of a black male certified school psychologist. And I want to give you an overview of the mental health exploitation network through the eyes of a black male doctor of clinical psychology. Now for those of you who don't know me, because this is my first time, you're my new family. Professionally, I'm a doctor of clinical psychology and I am a certified school psychologist. That means I work in the schools and I work in the clinic. As a doctor of clinical psychology, I evaluate and I diagnose mental illness. Bipolar, borderline, schizophrenia, suicide, low self-esteem, anxiety disorders, paranoid disorders, eating disorders, which, by the way, is on the rise for African American girls for the first time in American history. We never had an anorexia problem, and we never had a bulimia problem with black girls. Our daughters never ate a lot of food and then purged it all out or starved themselves so much that they are borderline malnutrition. That was never an issue for African American girls. That was predominantly a white female syndrome. But now we live in the age of the reality show where everybody wants to look a certain way and be a certain way. And as a result of that, our daughters are now being diagnosed with bulimia and anorexia nervosa. So, with that being said, a lot of mental illness in the black community is a direct result of self-hate, intergenerational trauma, and post-traumatic slavery disease. And why do I call post-traumatic slavery a disease? Because it is socially contagious. If you hang around self-hating black folks, you will start hating yourself. Okay? Self-hate is contagious. You gotta stay away from self-hating black folks because you might get infected with it as well. See, we teach our children the traumas of the previous generation. No black child is born knowing or thinking that nappy hair is ugly. But in the schools where I work, five and six year olds will tell you that your hair is nappy and ugly. They will tell you at five that your nose is too big. How does a five-year-old African child know that a big nose is not supposed to be a trap? You know who they learned it from? You all. Parents, family, and community. Which is why, at some point, as we evolve and build the Frederick Douglass Marcus Garvey Academy, I want it to be a residential academy. I want it to be overnight. I want him and him and him and him to be at the school overnight. I don't want them coming home. Because in your house there's a picture of a Caucasian Jesus. Why well, do this is the country. I know we got some white Jesus in here. Y'all country Negroes. I know we got a white Jesus. Okay? But I don't want them worshiping European images of God. It's okay for white people to worship European images of God because they're white. It's okay for Chinese to worship European images of Krishna or Christ because they're Chinese or Asian. And black people should worship God through your own image and lens. Not just because you're black, because Jesus actually was black. But let me get back to the school to prison pipeline. There's six stages in the Ohio school to prison pipeline. Stage number one, intentional miseducation. I need y'all to get this, because if you don't get this, you won't get nothing else. They are not making a mistake when they miseducate black boys in Dayton. They are not making a mistake when they miseducate black boys in Cincinnati. There is no mistake when they miseducate black boys in Columbus, in Akron, in Youngstown, in Cleveland, it is on purpose. And why? Why? Because the most revolutionary thing you can do in Ohio is properly educate a black boy. Because if you do that, you automatically put him in a position to challenge the white boy for political economic control of his state. So the schools must fail our children in order for white privilege to survive. 
It is not because his father's in jail. It is not because his mother's on food stamps. It is not because he lives in the ghetto. It is not because his pants are sagging. It is not because he wants to be a basketball player. It's because over 70% of the teachers in Ohio are middle class white females who can care less if our sons learned or not. Now I know some of you are uncomfortable when we talk about racial consciousness. But I'm going to deal with racial consciousness. And I'm going to beat racial consciousness into you until you stop acting like you live in a colorblind, multicultural society. There is nothing colorblind and nothing multicultural about the United States of America. Hell, the reason you're here in the first place is because you're black. You got Negroes walking around talking about something, I don't see color. When the last time you heard a Negro say that, all I see is people. And you know what? That's why black people dead last in Ohio. Because you're the only ethnic group in this state that don't put yourselves first. European Jews put Jewish issues first. Anglo-Saxons put Anglo-Saxon issues first. The Arabs put Arab agenda first. And you put Jesus and Muhammad first. And that's why you last. Nothing is wrong with the religion. But the religion must serve the agenda of the people. What have the black churches in Dayton done for the black community lately? Let me ask that another way. Where is the black clinic built by the black church? Where is the black school built by the black church? Where is the black hospital built by the black church? Where is the black supermarket built by the black church? Where is the elderly home built by the black church? Where is the homeless shelter built by the black church? Where is the distribution network built by the black church? Where is the manufacturing plant built by the black church? Where are the factories to hire our teenage kids so they don't have to sell dope built by the black church? Black America gives the black church over $13 million every Sunday of the year. $13 million, and you ain't got nothing to show for it. Pastor telling you, you got to die in order to be happy. Everybody keep preparing for death, because I'll be happy after I die. But the Chinese is happy in this life. The Asian is happy in this life. The Anglo-Saxon is happy in this life, and guess what? I'm going to be happy in this life, too. I'm not waiting to die to get no happiness. So you can tell Reverend Porkchop and Deacon Watermelon and Pastor Lemony that Dr. Umar Johnson don't want to hear nothing about no life after death. I want life before death. And if you ain't preaching life before death, I don't want nothing to do with you. See, I don't know if y'all been paying attention, but the black church has been suspiciously absent from the front line of all black issues in the last 40 years. Ever since the FBI murdered Dr. King on April 1st, 1968, April 4th, you ain't seen the black church involved in nothing significant affecting you. Why aren't the pastors of Dayton and Columbus fighting the school district for the dismally low graduation rates of black boys? Why aren't the pastors fighting your elected officials to change the incarceration laws? Ohio incarcerates black men at a rate higher than almost every other state in America. I ain't got no problem with you being no preacher. I'm a Pan-African. Most of my Pan-African ancestors were Christian. Garvey was a Christian. Alexander Kremer was a Christian. Henry Holland Garnett was a Christian. I ain't got a problem with the church. I got a problem with the way you carry out church. So stage number one, they intentionally miseducate the black boy. And by the way, I speak to you not only as a school psychologist and a doctor of clinical psychology, I speak to you as a certified school principal as well. I've ran school, so I know how schools operate. And you know who's the most important person in your child's school? It ain't your child, it's that white teacher in that classroom. And I don't want you to hate white folks. I want you to understand them though. See, here's where we mess up. Most black women in here today, my mothers, you tend to give the school system the benefit of the doubt. And the reason y'all give the school system the benefit of the doubt, because for a black woman, you cannot understand how a white woman could mistreat a five-year-old child. 
So when your son's teacher calls you up and says, can we evaluate Raheem for a learning disability? The first thing you do is you scratch your head and you say, wait a minute, he only five. How can he possibly have trouble learning if he just started learning? But then you say, she is a mother like me. She is a woman like me. So obviously, she must see something I don't see. That's your first mistake. Black mothers, listen to me. I'm a master school psychologist. I happen to believe I'm the best one in the country. But I can never know your child better than you can. And when you get a vibration in your gut, when your spirit tells you that this don't sound right, nine times out of ten, it ain't right. Follow your own gut. Stop letting white people with degrees make you think they know your child better than you do. And by the way, room number one today, room number one, Dayton, never ever in your life, as long as you live, let a school evaluate a child six years or younger. Under no circumstances, under no circumstances do you let one of them get evaluated for a learning disability. You don't let one of them get evaluated for ADHD. You don't let one of them get evaluated for an emotional disturbance. You don't let one of them get evaluated for a conduct disorder. You don't let one of them get evaluated for a mild intellectual disability. And by the way, black boys are four times as likely as white boys in this country to be diagnosed as retarded when they're not. That's a fact from the white man. If your son has mild mental retardation, if it's that damn mild, how do we know he got it at all? And we're going to talk about the intelligence test in a minute, because that's the major weapon of special education. But you don't get them evaluated as babies. Dr. Umar, what's wrong with catching the disability early? What's wrong with knowing my son got a reading problem early? What's wrong with knowing my daughter, who's seven years old in the second grade, has a math disability? Isn't it good to get it diagnosed early so we can catch it? We're not dealing with the flu. We're not dealing with cancer. We're not dealing with diabetes. We're not dealing with kidney failure. We're not dealing with heart disease. See, with heart disease, there's an x-ray that shows you you got heart disease. With diabetes, there's a sugar test that tells you you got diabetes. With cancer, there's an ultrasound that shows you you got cancer. Now let me ask you this. What proof do we have that your son really has a learning disability? What proof do we have that your daughter really has a math disability? What proof do we have that your grandson really has ADHD? What proof do we have that your nephew is really emotionally disturbed? What are you saying, Dr. Umar? I'm saying that none of the diagnoses we make in special ed can be proven to exist. When someone says your son has a reading disability, they are giving you one thing, their expert opinion and nothing else. That's right. Your son got an IEP out here in Trotwood? an IEP out in Dayton for reading, an IEP up in Columbus for math, he got an IEP for emotional disturbance. Guess what IEP stand for? Not individual education plan. I call it what it really is, incarceration education program. You know what I want to know tonight? I want to know why black parents love special ed so much. Can somebody tell me what's so special about special education? Because I've been in it for 20 years and I'm still trying to find out what Negroes love about intentional miseducation. Is there special ed at the job? Is there special ed in the military? Is there special ed in college? So why are you giving your children invisible crutches, making them think that if they choose the right label, they will be given a pass? Ain't no passes in America for no black boy. You gotta be twice as good to get half as much. And y'all running around here, spoiling these black boys, making them think, you ain't got to try, Raheem. I'll get you an IEP. Oh, wow. 20 years from now, you'll be saying that through a prison cell. Yeah. 
because if a black boy can't read by the time he finishes the fifth grade, there's a 75% chance he will spend some of his adulthood in a maximum security prison. Special Ed is the school to prison pipeline. You don't let them evaluate no young child like that. If it was up to me, we wouldn't even diagnose children. We diagnose the homes they come from. I would diagnose y'all. He ain't got no learning disability. They have a parenting disability. See, there's something that we used to have in the black community called homework. Anybody ever heard of that? Because I can't find it no more. Homework has been replaced with video games. Homework has been replaced with football practice. Homework has been replaced with Instagram. Homework has been replaced with Twitter. Homework has been replaced with reality TV shows. See, when I was a fifth grader back in North Philadelphia, we didn't have all that when I was growing up in the 80s. So if I wanted to have fun, my father made me read. I was a bookworm, and I'm still a bookworm now. Never got into video games. I wasn't much of an athlete, so all I could do was read. That's why I did so well in school, because I understand the words used on the test. And the reason why your kids failed the state test in Ohio isn't because they don't know the information. They can't understand the questions being asked. Let me be clear. The number one weapon of white supremacy in Ohio state public schools is to confuse black kids about the questions by using words they know you never expose them to. Oh, yes. The vocab is the weapon. Let me give you an example. Your third grader taking a test. There's a math a word problem, and there's a word in there, and he never saw it before, so he asks the teacher, uh, Mrs. Uh, Weeningberger. <laughs> Ms. Weeningberger, can you tell me what this word is, Ms. Weeningberger? And she says, I'm sorry, Raheem, we're not allowed to help you. But if I don't know what this word means, I can't understand the question. And if I can't understand the question, I won't get the answer right. And Ms. Weedingberger says, we're sorry, so your son ends up scoring below basic. And you say to yourself, my teacher said that my son was the smartest kid in the class. That he was the most advanced kid in the class mathematically. How did he score below basic? You know how he scored below basic? Because he didn't understand the words. He was good at math, but his working vocabulary was trash. He was good at math, but his working vocabulary was trash. Why do you think they like to ask the math questions using words instead of numbers? Because they know Negro babies don't read. And I know you don't read. Because I'm a mobile therapist. I go into the homes. And every time I go into a home to do therapy, you know what I'm looking for? A bookshelf. And guess what I hardly ever find in your homes? A bookshelf. I don't see no dictionary, I don't see no thesaurus, I don't see no encyclopedia, but I see a lot of Air Jordans, I see a lot of cell phones, I see a lot of Gucci and Louis, I see a lot of hair, I see a lot of Timberlands, I see a lot of mixtapes, no reading material. In other words, your house ain't even a house, it's a prison cell already. White folks are mad at me across the country because they're trying to figure out how I even got where I got before they knew who I was. <laughs> and it ain't hard to explain to you how I got to where I am. I know how to play the white man's game. When I went on my interview for the doctoral program, I act just like every other coon. Put on a tight suit and walk my ass into the interview. <laughs> And they said, why do you want to study here at this prestigious university? I said, oh my God, I don't know where to begin. <laughs> oh my God, Mrs. Weeningberger, her book on child psychological trauma in prenatal years. Oh my God, I can't stop reading it. Oh, and Dr. Silverberger, I love his research on adolescent reading skills prior to high school. He said, it's the Negro we need. Let him do it. <laughs> So I went through the doctoral program quietly for four years, and then a black woman, Coon, working for the university, snitched on me. She went to the slave master's office and said, do you know who that is? <laughs> oh yeah, that's who I just, no, no. Do you know who he is? You better go to YouTube. So the white folks pulled up the computer and went to YouTube and put it to Umar Johnson. And they said, oh, hell no. This is Malcolm X. 
They tried to kick me out the program, tried to separate me out the program, tried to do everything they could to stop me from getting my doctor. And a program that took five years cost me eight years because I refused to engage in racial amnesia. Right. See, the problem with the average educated Negro is you try to act more white the more you go up. I don't do that. I'm not shedding my skin for the white folks. I'm black all day long. And the way I talk to you now is the way I talk to them too. Ain't no switching up. Some of you Negroes with degrees, you act all black with us, and then when you're around the white folks, oh yes, Dr. Small, yes, that was an excellent point you made. You don't sound like that. <laughs> Take the face out your voice, pants on tight, skinny shirts, trying to fit in with white folks. You can't fit in. Haven't you learned we've been here 400 years, you still don't understand? You don't believe me? Come back to Philadelphia. Go ask Bill Cosby what white folks that taught him about thinking you've been accepted. This is the number one black TV personality in American history. He's sitting in a prison right now, legally blind. He need two guards to go to the bathroom, two guards to eat, two guards to shower. Brothers in there crying the way they treat Bill Cosby. Legally blind in a maximum security prison. Why? Because he kept company with white girls. Let's talk about that for a minute. Because I know this is trot with Negroes love white girls. Y'all love some white ass women. Yes, you do. You love them! Oh, turkey and cheese, no seasoning in the meat ass white girl. You love a white girl. Yes, you do. And y'all don't even get the key ones. You get old nasty best. Three neck solid. 25 kneecaps Helen. And they get mad at me. I got Negroes emailing me every day. Brother, listen, I love you. I rocks with you. You help me with my son, but you got to stop talking about these white women. Had another Negro tell me, Dr. Umar, I agree with you, brother. But I married my white queen 20 years ago. What am I supposed to do? Get up and leave her? I said, how old is your youngest child? He said, 14. I said, well, in four years, you can get your emancipation proclamation. <laughs> See, black men, and I'm not fair to disrespect no white women, but black men, you can't fall in love with somebody you ain't interested in. I've been around white girls all my life. They love me, because I'm a pro-black Negro. They really like us. Because we the big King Kong catch. If you can get a pro-black RBG, you know you can get a black man. They love me in college, love me in doctoral school, had white girls bringing me shirts and uh, coffee. I don't even drink coffee. <laughs> bringing me a damn Starbucks. I don't drink that shit. <laughs> white girls was in love with me. But guess what? I was never interested in it. So it never went nowhere. Because I value black women. And I want you Negroes here to know, and I don't care who don't like it, if you are dating anything other than one of my sisters, you a damn sellout, and you can take that to the bank. Take it to the bank. I don't care if you don't like it. And black women, have you noticed when, a, when you see a black man with a white woman, he go out of his way not to speak to you when he with his white woman, don't he? He will look the other direction to prove to his European queen that he ain't interested in melody. But she is. Everybody wants the black man's melanin because the black man is the original man. Yeah, white women like black males. Of course they will. Why wouldn't they? We the original man. We the melanated being. We are the sons of the sun. S-O-N of the S-U-N. Yeah. So I know why the white woman like me. It's because her defective DNA cries out for my completed DNA. See, when the Bible talks about us being holy, you don't even know what holy means. Holy means to be psychobiologically and spiritually complete. When God made the African woman and the African man, he made us whole, which makes us holy. There's no other holy people on the planet. And that's why every prophet looked like you. Not another prophet was a white man. We the holy ones. But the problem is the church and the mosque that made you separate your racial divinity from your spiritual worship. We're the only people who will separate blackness from religion, blackness from God, blackness from spirituality. Everybody else, they can honor their color, their culture, and their heritage in the same place they pray. Not you. 
You're the only people in America got to go one place to pray and another place to organize. One place to worship and somewhere else to fight police genocide. Why can't I fight police? If this is the church and we do God's work, why can't I organize against evil right here? Because the preacher ain't nothing but a pawn for the politician. And by the way, I don't vote for black folks no more unless they can answer me three questions. If I live in Trotwood, I got three questions. You want to be city council? You want to be mayor? You want to be state rep? You want to be U.S. rep? You want to be U.S. senator? You want to be state senator, block captain, alderman? Whatever it is, you better answer me three questions. Number one, are you Democrat or are you Republican? Because if you are either one of those, you don't get my vote. The Democratic Party is a white racist institution. The Republican Party is a white racist institution. And neither one of them has ever done anything for black folks. That's right. So if you're not an independent candidate, that means you're not an independent thinker. And if you're not an independent thinker, you're not going to do in anything independently from what white folks tell you to do. A black Democrat is on the Democratic team. He's going to do what his Democratic Party bosses tell him to do. Why do you think I've been electing black folks all throughout Ohio for 50 years? since King, and you ain't got nothing because they're financed by the Democratic Party. And the hand that pays is the hand that rules. How the hell you think black folks being financed by white folks gonna carry out a black agenda? You out your mind. These coons ain't gonna never do nothing for you because you don't put your money where your mouth is. And when we get serious, because part of this is our fault too, it's not all the politics, because you wanna spend your money on Gucci and you wanna spend your money on Mercedes. And you would have spent your money on Sarat Baca. And you would have spent your money on weaves. First of all, I don't date a woman. If I can't grab your head and pull it back. If I can't grab that neck. I can't date you. I don't understand how black men date women who ain't got their own head. You ever see a sister after she get her head done? She got to sleep standing up. You come out the bathroom, she in the bed meditating. Because she can't lay down because she's going to crush this side of the weed. What kind of life is that? Walking around with your head hurting all day, they doing this all damn day. <laughs> the beauty shop pulling all your roots out. You got a damn coat jack at 30 years old. <laughs> Better let the roots grow back. That's why when I get married, I ain't gonna ask the questions most brothers ask. Most brothers wanna know how many kids you got in, what kind of job you got in, what's your income, and how many baby dads, and I don't wanna ask none of that. I got one question before I marry my queen, whoever she may be, wherever she may be at. And that question is simply, can I see your scalp? Because I wanna see how many holes you got, bumps, craters, ringworm. I need to do a scalp inspection. Damn that. That's going to be in my marriage contract. If I don't see that scalp, this is a no. Because I'll be damned, I'm going to go to my honeymoon and you're going to pull that thing off and show me all types of lumps. I didn't wipe that. Get your new growth back. And most black women, you need to go bald anyway or go shortcut. Y'all be hiding your face with that long hair. Cut it off. Let your features shine. Black women are beautiful, but you want to hide your beauty with all this hair. If somebody told you a big nose and big lips is ugly, but the white woman paid ten thousand dollars for the same thing you got. Come on, we imitate people imitating us, which makes us the dumbest individuals on earth. So now you know why I've never been on Oprah. She'll bring ten psychologists to regurgitate what I say. Next time you see a black psychologist on TV, you're going to say, I heard Dr. Umar say the exact same thing in trial with expense of your oppression. And no white person will ever undo your oppression in order to undo their privilege. And this is why white people can stab you in your back and hurt your feelings because you fail to understand something. The white man has a loyalty to himself above and beyond anybody else. And your problem is you don't have a loyalty to yourself above and beyond anything else. Rule number two, white people don't share power with black folks. Whenever you see white folks taking over Trotwood, gentrifying Dayton, gentrifying Columbus, taking back Cincinnati, they're not coming to share those cities with black folks, they're coming to push you on out. Rule number three, white folks will do anything to take power from black folks. 
They created AIDS. They created Ebola. They pushed homosexuality as a birth control strategy. Listen, if we got gay people in here, uh, lesbians, I love you too. You're still my family. But I got a right to disagree with your lifestyle because I don't want them learning that that is normal because it's not. Thank you. Homosexuality is a retro Roman cultural behavior. I'm not going to hate you. I'm going to love you like I love everybody else. But I'm going to take issue with you if you tell me that we should be promoting that to our children. And black women, I want to chastise y'all for that. Because y'all the main ones running around talking about it ain't no good black men around. How in the hell are you going to tell me on the one hand it ain't no good black men, and on the other hand, you hanging around with 55 gay male friends? Hot peaches, candy, apple, sweet watermelon. How the hell are you going to get some men for our women when all your friends are gay? Don't tell me you need a good black man when you're hanging out with them. You need to be challenging them brothers to be men instead of letting them try to imitate you. A man can't be a woman, and a woman can't be a man. And once our boys understand what black manhood is really about, they'll never want to imitate a woman anyway. Once upon a time, there was a black man named Booker T. Washington. He was born in Charleston, West Virginia, right at the end of slavery. He walked to Hampton, Virginia to get an education. He couldn't afford to pay the tuition at Hampton Institute in Virginia. So he asked for an opportunity to work his way through the college. They allowed him to work his way through the college in exchange for the tuition. When he graduated from Hampton, the white principal at Hampton got a phone call and said, we need a black man who's educated to go to Tuskegee, Alabama, and teach black folks in Tuskegee how to make a living. Booker T. Washington accepted the job. When he got to Tuskegee, there was no school. So he used an old barn, an old church, a half-finished warehouse. When the state of Alabama came to Booker T. Washington and said, I'm going to subsidize your school, Booker T. Washington said, I don't want your money. Like Dr. Umar Johnson, Booker T. Washington, a hundred years ago, told them crackers, you keep your money. This is a black man's school. And when the first students of Tuskegee, Alabama showed up, they said, Dr. Washington, where's our lunchroom? Where's our bathroom? Where's the shower? Where's the lecture hall? He said, you standing on it. Right. And that black man born a slave told them kids to roll up their sleeves and the students of Tuskegee dug up the ground and made their own buildings, cooked their own food, sewed their own clothes. They became so famous for making bricks that the white construction companies would come and buy bricks from the students of Tuskegee instead of the white men of Alabama. Mm. And then Booker T said, I need a science teacher. He heard of a black man from Iowa State, the first of his race to get a PhD in agricultural science. He was considered the number one scientist in America, not black, period. His name was Dr. George Washington Carter, also born into slavery, castrated as a child. White people cut his penis off because they was afraid that he would want to have sex with their white daughter. That's why George Washington Carter never had children, and that's why he had a high-pitched voice. Testosterone was taken away. Booker T came to him and said, I need a science teacher. At the time, George Washington Carter was being offered multi-million dollar contracts to go and work for white military corporations. He turned it down and went to Alabama. And when he got there, he said, Booker T, where's my office? Where's my science lab? Where's my lecture hall? Booker T said, George, I have nothing but what you see. And George Washington Carter, a castrated black man, who they said would talk to plants and make them grow, went to the trash and took out from the garbage of the students of Tuskegee, copper, iron, metal, wood, aluminum, and from the garbage, from the garbage, gave us 200 products from the peanut. From the garbage, 500 products from the soybean. From the garbage, 400 products from the sweet potato. Ohio, can I ask you a question? How is it you have so much and have created nothing? Our ancestors had nothing and created so much. Black power, Bacon, Ohio, thanks for coming out. Love you.